Welcome. This is Rise Learning Machines Seminars. I am Olaf Moda, and uh, Rise is Sweden's public research institute with around 3,000 people working on a wide array of research topics. Us at the computer science department and the Center for Applied AI worked on uh, applied AI projects for the benefit of society. And we organize these weekly learning machines seminars. This meeting will be recorded. And if anyone wants to be removed from this recording, let us know. Also make sure to check out the collection of great talks on our YouTube channel. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce Joachim Lindblad, who is professor at Uppsala University. <clears throat> Joachim defended his PhD in 2003 and has been a postdoc at BC Cancer Research Center in Vancouver. He's also been an assistant professor at Uppsala University and Novi Sad, and associate research professor at the Mathematical Institute in Belgrade. He's also one of the inventors uh, behind the real-time video tracking technology of ProTracer. Uh, some of his research interests are within image analysis, uh, explainable AI, multimodal and self-supervised representation learning. And the topic today is trustworthy AI-based decision support in cancer diagnostics. And with this said, I will stop my screen sharing and hand over the word to you, Joachim. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Olaf. And I will try to share my screen. Uh, can you see it and can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, that is nice. So, um, welcome everyone, glad that you are here. Uh, today I plan to talk about trustworthy AI-based decision support in cancer diagnostics. And, and as you heard, I'm a professor in computerized image processing at the Center for Image Analysis at the uh, Uppsala University. Um, more specifically, I'm a member of the MIDA group. Uh, which is Methods for Image, Analysis, uh, Image Data Analysis group. Uh, so we are a small group of researchers which, who are working on development of general methods for image data analysis. So a focus on generality, but uh, we, our research is uh, essentially always application driven. Uh, and most often we uh, look at applications within medicine and life science. Um, and uh, this is a list of a kind of number of ongoing projects at the MIDA group. Uh, so uh, quite wide range of methods. And today I will focus on, on these ones. So AI supported early oral cancer detection. Um, and that has, uh, it's a bigger project that involves a lot of interesting uh, things. And I would like my aim of my talk today is uh, quite a lot of, of sharing uh, experiences with different techniques that we have used, uh, some lessons we learned along the way, uh, and, and, and hopefully that can be useful for you as well uh, in other applied uh, machine learning projects. Um, so a bit of explainable AI, a bit of learning from weekly annotated data, a bit of representation learning and a bit of multimodal uh, learning. So why uh, oral cancer detection uh, in the first place? So um, cancer in the oral cavity uh, in the throat is really one of the more common malignancies in the world. Um, there are around 1,200 cases yearly in Sweden, which, um, for example, is twice as many as those who uh, get cervical cancer. For cervical cancer, we do have a screening program, but we do not have that for oral cancer detection. The five-year survival is, is quite okay. Uh, it's around 50, 60 percent. But in advanced cases, when the uh, malignancy is detected late, it can be as low as three to four um, percent. And uh, of course, then the most, it, it, if you do detect the cancer, in most cases, you can just cut it away. Uh, and really the most efficient way of decreasing the number of deaths in uh, oral cancer is through early detection. So assuming that we could in, ha have a screening program uh, similar as for cervical cancer, also for oral cancer, uh, that would allow 
detecting the malignancy before symptoms are starting to appear. However, with the methods that uh, the healthcare system are using today, this cannot be done because the sampling is typically done by tissue biopsies. So you're uh, cutting out a piece of meat from the patient and then uh, do a histological evaluation on the microscope, which is uh, like this blue and pinkish image in the lower right corner. So of course, this is a painful procedure. We can't do that as a screening uh, and it's also costly. So instead of doing that, um, since uh, I think almost eight years back now, we are uh, working on uh, creating a program where uh, we, we uh, do cancer screening at your, uh, at your dentist. Uh, and uh, instead of this painful and costly, costly tissue sampling, uh, we are aiming to use brush sampling. Um, and uh, we have actually tried that this can be done uh, by a dental hygienist with a one day training course, they can make good sampling. This is virtually painless. Uh, it's fast and it's cheap to take the samples. Uh, but of course, to make this cheap also on the analysis scale, we need to combine this with computer assisted diagnostic support. So this is where we get into uh, the machine learning part then, of course. So in other words, uh, for me, as in, in image processing, this is about AI uh, supported cytology, where cytology means that uh, typically we, we acquire whole slide images as the one we see in the upper right corner. These are huge images. Uh, resolution is around 100,000 times 100,000 pixels. So it's not something that you easily fit in your laptop. Uh, and then what uh, uh, the manual examination means is that a cytopathologist, a, a skilled uh, expert is going through this slide, the whole slide and looking at all the cells and looking at uh, cells which show malignancy uh, that look suspicious and, and if we find such then then we go further uh, with uh, with the patients so this is uh, it's very difficult uh, it's not easy to find this skilled expertise there is a global lack of trained cytopathologists in the world uh, and also this is tedious and time consuming and that of course means that it is it is expensive so uh, we would like to replace that with an automated examination in one way or another uh, which is, of course, then faster and cheaper, but there are other problems along the way, and I will bring up some of them today. So um, without further ado, I will just say that we have uh, already developed a quite decent uh, deep learning based system, um, which uh, has a number of components, and I this is really just an overview slide, to, to, and I will get more into the details then, but essentially, uh, we acquire brush sampling at, uh, at the point of care, for example, at a dentist. These are then put in a vial and transported to a local center. And the nice thing with this is that the sampling procedure is easy and we don't need to have equipment out in the field, uh, but we, we can send this sample, it's nicely stable. Uh, and at the lab, this is then spread out on a glass slide, fully automatically uh, stained, and we scan that and then we get these whole slide images uh, and then we base uh, we do the ai based analysis which we get to in the further steps so i was a little bit thinking about how to uh, make this presentation uh, as useful uh, as possible for 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 the audience and i feel like as i said i, I would like to share lessons learned uh, and I have a bit of color coding then uh, where I just go through a, a standard workflow, which I think is applicable for essentially any um, machine learning, deep learning uh, project. Uh, and then we have a bit of lessons learned. Then uh, in the end, I have a couple of extras, which are maybe more problem specific uh, for cancer diagnostics. But I think uh, also that can be useful for other applications. So I hope that you find it, it useful. So let's start with the workflow, uh, a workflow slide then. So of course, 
Um, I'm a computer scientist and this is a medical project. Uh, not everyone can do everything in, in a bigger project. So, so very important is to gather a good team. So this is my slide where I'm giving a bit of recognition to all the people involved in this. Uh, so we have funding from various sources and we are also collaborating with uh, a number of centers in India where uh, actually oral cancer is the third most common cancer uh, and, and a very big problem. Um, so step one, gather a good team. Then naturally for doing deep learning, uh, we know that yeah, step, step two is collect a lot of data. And um, this can be tricky. The data should be of course realistic. Um, and we have managed to collect from three different centers uh, a couple of years ago uh, in Sweden um, and also in India, but it's very difficult to, to get consistency in, in the sample preparations uh, between the continents. That's an observation to make. I'm really happy to say that now we have a running project actually. So we have since uh, last year, an ongoing five-year multi-center study uh, which currently involves these eight regions in Sweden where uh, samples are being collectively uh, uh, over five years. And just to mention, so uh, in, as most people know in Sweden, the, the healthcare is divided on a regional level in Sweden. In Sweden, we have 21 regions and uh, I like to call them the 21 non-united states of Sweden because they all have their own IT system, they all have their own routines. It's not even certain that you know uh, oral cancer is categorized in some of them, this falls under dentistry, in some of them it falls under head and neck, uh, and, and that is a mess. But I will not uh, talk more about that, but let's get more technical. Okay. Um, let's assume that we want to do supervised learning or let's assume that we at all want to evaluate what we, we are trying to do. So of course, to evaluate, uh, we need some kind of ground truth, gold standard, true answers uh, to our question. And when going for that, uh, one observation to make is that we actually have two separate problems uh, and that is localization and classification. Uh, well, we do want to make a patient diagnosis, but we want to have some information on the cell level as well. And we will get to more into why this is important for us. So for now, let's think that we have localization, that is, we want to do cell detection, and then we have the classification problem. We want to say, is this a malignant cell or not, to put it simply. The first problem there, cell detection, finding the objects of interest, is not a very difficult one. And essentially we can ask any reasonably skilled person uh, to mark all cell nuclei in the region. Uh, and that will give us a, a, a good view, a, a kind of, of uh, good training material. Now comes my, uh, so checkbox on that. And now comes my first lesson learned, um, which I, something I like to preach. And that is, do not segment unless you uh, really have to. So uh, this boils down simply to don't solve a problem which is more difficult than the one you have to. There are tons of people doing cell segmentation and doing reliable cell segmentation in cytopathological data is really difficult because cells are overlapping, cells are broken, uh, and, and, and simply this is really difficult. And of course, if we are looking right now at the collect ground truth data, then this is also very expensive to collect. So we don't need segmented cells. This is uh, typically given by you know, classic image analysis pipelines where the first thing is to segment your cells and then you measure things. Deep learning methods are excellent with working with the image data straight away. So we don't need to do any segmentation. Then uh, a bunch of things in the workflow then for this first problem, train one or several networks, evaluate performance, of course, on a separate uh, held out data set uh, and tweak and repeat from, from number four. So this is the standard workflow. Um, 
this is the the approach that we came up with which scales nicely to these really large images and uh, around 100,000 uh, objects uh, as well visible in the images so for example yolo type of approaches doesn't really work well to, with this large number of of, of, uh, of objects but uh, uh unit type of architecture uh, and we do a, a, a regression problem. So we turn this detection problem into regression problem, simply putting a Gaussian blob for every object uh, in our training data. And then we should, we, we, it's like an image to image translation, simply given the input image, the network should produce something uh, like our ground truth. This is a pseudo color image that we see in the lower to see the contrast better. And there we can simply detect local maxima in the image. And this works well. So first task uh, completely nice. The second problem, the cell classification problem is a much more difficult one. We can no longer ask a reasonably skilled person to do this. We'd really need a very skilled person. And if we look at, you know, uh, both old, and this is a very new paper from 2023, evaluation on comparison, how good the humans actually are. And we realized that on this slide, on the patient level, the human cytopathological uh, sensitivity and specificity is around 70, 80%, 90% stated somewhere. So the conclusion is that this is really a too difficult problem for the human to perform. So we can't rely on the human annotations to give us the ground truth data. What do we do then? Uh, lessons learned number two, uh, well, seek the best ground truth that you can find. And what is the ground truth that we can find in this case? Uh, the current gold standard for setting the diagnosis is the histopath histopathological diagnosis. So it's based on the tissue sampling. We do have that in the healthcare system today. So that is something that we can get. Just to mention, of course, an even better ground truth would be to actually look at the future. How is it going for these patients? Uh, and therefore, it's really nice to know that our five-year study is a longitudinal study where we are actually following the patients over time. And I really hope uh, then that one can, you know, once a, a, a cancer is detected, we can go backwards in time and see, well, now, knowing this, can we detect it earlier on uh, in, in uh, using our AI techniques? So that would be really cool. For the moment, uh, we are forced to use histopathology. So we are using another modality in this case uh, uh, for, for getting us the ground truth data. Now, one observation to make there, OK, now we have re fairly reliable information about cancer or not cancer, but this information we have on the patient level. And as I already mentioned, we would like to have this information on the cell level. So how do we do that? Well, um, for the moment, let's just reformulate the problem. Let's ignore the problem more or less and say that instead of classifying each cell as normal or malignant, we classify the cells as does this cell come from a healthy patient or does it come from a patient uh, with cancer? So in, in that sense, the label is, I mean, we do have a label for every cell, but the interpretation of the meaning of this label is a bit interesting. But let's leave it at that for the moment and, and, and we will get back to it later on. Um, coming back to our workflow, uh, train one or several networks, uh, evaluate performance, tweak and repeat. Um, Again, uh, for the segmentation, for, for the cell detection task, uh, pretty standard network worked quite well. For the classification task, it's even more standard. Uh, ResNet 50, DenseNet, uh, Squeeze and Excite networks push the, the, the performance a little bit further. Uh, but, you know, the, the standard tools, they do work. Uh, and it's more a matter of what you do around these tools. What is the data augmentation that you use and things like that. Um, and uh, uh, using these techniques, we do arrive at close to 100% uh, patient accuracy on a limited data set, uh, I should say. So we are collecting more data and, and hope to get this into a level that actually can be uh, verified to be usable in, in healthcare. You what okay? is also yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. 
so you said you you didn't use annotations for for detecting cells, and now you say you detect cells. I said what we 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 did use annotations for detecting the cells, okay. uh, but, but we don't use for... annotations for so... segmenting the cells. So we only have a marker. This is where we have one cell. This is where I have another cell. But we don't try to outline the cell. We don't try to say this is the boundary of, 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 the, of the nucleus. This is the boundary of the cytoplasm. So it is really just object detection, which is, of course, so much easier. You can fast go through an image and just click on every cell uh, instead of having to draw uh, around the cell. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um... Yes, um, <laughs> what's, what is really interesting is that using this modified uh, problem description, uh, actually the networks are able to sell, say with an accuracy of around 81% or 80, around 80% if the cell is originating from a patient with cancer. What that means uh, is a bit interesting, but uh, for the moment we can conclude that looking at the, the percentage of cells which are classified as positive, in this case, from a, uh, a patient with cancer, uh, is significantly higher for those that actually have cancer. And we can put a threshold uh, on the uh, percentage of cells in the sample and uh, accurately uh, on the patient level making, make a classification. But we don't really know still on the cell level which cells are malignant because um, actually cells which are also in the vicinity of a malignancy, they show a, a reaction to this uh, tumor which is in the neighborhood. Uh, and it might be that this is something that the network is picking up. So how to interpret this is result is a little bit tricky, which is exactly what I would get into. But before doing that, I would just mention a few of the tweak and repeat uh, things that we that we have, which is like a quick list. Uh, this worked for us. It might work for you. It might not. But you know, uh, let's hear what worked for us. So uh, we have limited data, uh, of course. Most of the time, you have limited data, and then you would like to do pre-training. Uh, pre-training on ImageNet does not really work uh, for biomedical tasks. The images are simply too different. Looking around for more useful pre-training data, it starts to appear slowly, far too slowly, I would say. Uh, you know, large public data sets from primarily radiology, also towards histology. So far, there is no image uh, net for cytology data. Uh, I hope we will be able to publish our data set when it is uh, collected. It is in the ethical permit that we should be allowed to do that. So uh, that would be a, a good thing. Another observation is that we really need the resolution because it, the, the texture of the cell nucleus uh, is important for the classification of cancer, non-cancer, and that is known from before. But we can also see this in the performance when we do data augmentation. So quite often when you do data augmentation, you do random scalings and, and rotations and things like that. And we see actually that when we do uh, data augmentation that involves interpolation, such as rotation with a not 90 degrees, then the performance actually goes down. So in this case, the texture is important uh, and we want to keep it. Other thing we looked at for data augmentation was to use some kind of GANs for it. Uh, it produces beautiful images of the cells, but it doesn't really boost the performance. I can say now uh, this is before uh, diffusion models. We haven't explored diffusion models, but I don't really see any, any reason to believe that they would work better, but it could be worth exploring. Um, Knowing that texture is important, we did try something of a hybrid approach, and that is, you know, uh, let's combine some shallow features, so engineered features with the deep learning. Uh, in this case, we combined known texture features such as locally bin local binary patterns with the deep learning pipeline, and that did give a boost. 
Uh, I'm not really sure if that will remain as we get gather more image data, but if you have in your in the low data regime, definitely combining with some shallow features may pay off because then we don't have to learn these features. We also looked at something which is called rotation equivariant architectures, and that is then knowing that rotation of our slide doesn't really matter. It's, it depends on how we put it into the microscope, right? And it doesn't change the, 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 the cells. Uh, there are deep learning architectures that takes this into consideration. However, uh, for us, it didn't really improve uh, with suitable data augmentation and enough data uh, we can work with the standard neural networks, which makes the training faster and, and less memory hungry. So that didn't pay off. Uh, this is a bit of summary, of course, in some sense, having a lot of data is nice. More data definitely beats data augmentation. Uh, and however, getting reliable human annotation is not easy. Uh, and even if we don't need it for training, we would like to have it for, for testing and evaluation of the methods. And as I also mentioned, these images are really huge. So 100,000 times 100,000 images. So it's a 10 gigapixel image. And we also typically acquire uh, actually a focus stack of uh, approximately 10 focus layers, which means that just one image is 40 gigabytes of data in compressed form. So this is not something that you just throw around on your laptop and, and share in that sense with uh, cytopathologists to get input. Um, and in order to uh, then enable this collaborative work within the team, uh, we actually developed our own uh, software for handling this type of data. This, so we created what is called the Cyto Browser which is an open browser-based collaborative annotation tool for whole slide images. So uh, where uh, the image sits on the server and you are uh, looking at the image in your browser, uh, like a Google Maps interface. But in addition to that, and that is what I still think is unique with the, our software, is the collaborative nature of it. So it, in, in some sense, it also works like a Google document where several people can be logged in and you know, annotate together, communicate about the annotations and, and uh, you know, jointly work uh, on, on the same document, in this case, on, on the same slide. And yes, uh, as we see in the lower right corner, you can run it on your mobile phone if you want to. So that really helped us to, to work with people in different parts of the world. I commented, we have people in India who are involved in this as well. We are also working with uh, people in North Africa. And then of course, if you can run it on a mobile phone, that, that really helps. Um, so um, taking a step back uh, now, after 25 minutes, I will drink some water. We have a general lack of reliable annotated data for supervised learning. Can we do something better? Can we go beyond the supervised learning uh, is a natural question to pose. And we looked into a bit of different approaches uh, and one approach uh, which actually turned out to be useful for us is self-supervised learning and in particular contrastive learning. So self-supervised learning, I believe that most people know about this uh, today, and that is that you are training the network to solve another task uh, where the, the ground truth is kind of given automatically. So in this case, we have a, a one task here is to just to unrotate the bird and say what is up and down. The other task is to solve a jigsaw puzzle type of, 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 of problem, and you should know uh, where to put the pieces. And in this case, we can train the network to learn something about properties of images and, 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 and how they are uh, functional. Of course, rotation task is meaningless for, for, for cell data. I already pointed that out. The jigsaw puzzle task doesn't really work either. So um, the task that is used for the self-supervised learning is quite important. One thing that... Uh, in several situations has worked well for us is to use uh, self-supervised learning in combination with contrastive learning. So contrastive learning um, is essentially learning uh, 
what objects are uh, what what is similar in an image and what is different and and the way we we do that uh, and most people do that is that you present different views of the same data so that can be uh data which is augmented in different ways. Here we have a, a picture of a cat, which is cropped in slightly different ways. But we as humans, we can conclude that this is the same image without knowing that this is a cat. So the thing, the key thing here is that we don't have the class label. Is this a cat or a dog? It's just that, yeah, this is the same image. The change between these two images is small. So we're training the network to see that uh, a, a slight change of view, a slight change of rotation, a slight change of focus is not important for uh, saying whether this is a cancer cell or not. So in that sense, we're learning what is similar and what is dissimilar in, 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 in the images. Uh, and as to mention here, here for this training, we can use rotations of with which do interpolation because we don't do the classification here. We just learn in the network to uh, create a good representation of the data, which is insensitive to the variations that we have uh, from the from the image creation. So we have noise in the imaging. We have uh, quite some amount of staining variations. If this is done in lab A or done in lab two, you may have different colors. And we can this way teach the network that these changes they don't matter. And pre-training in this way, and then uh, using uh, that for a, the, the representation that you get for a classification problem uh, quite often helps uh, in, in, in our performances. Um, what about un completely unsupervised method then? So this was self-supervised. We're solving some type of task. Um, really unsupervised methods is the, the most common one is, is clustering which we have looked at uh, also. Uh, my PhD student, Amai Nadeshta. Um, this is a UMAP uh, visualization of a data cloud. And then we're looking at different clusters in this data, data cloud, communicating, of course, with the medical expert, the cytopathologists, you know, what is it that differentiate these types of cells that we see in the different clusters? And yes, this is, a, can be a useful technique to gain some kind of intuitive knowledge about the data. And most importantly, it's useful for detecting faulty data. If you have outliers in, in, in this clustering, and then you can look at this uh, in more in detail, and maybe it turns out that, that your machine was wrong, something like that. But we should always know that the un completely unsupervised method, they know nothing about the task. And what is highlighted in this uh, methods, what they find as most relevant, may or may not be interesting, depending on, on, on what it finds to, to, to focus on. And another thing is that it's also very, very difficult to quantitatively evaluate the, the effectiveness of, of this. So, so that was something that uh, Nadeshta was really struggling with. Um, getting back to our workflow. We have done the, 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 the learning of the, the, the AI part. What do we want to do more? Well, of course, we want to compare with humans. Uh, and for this to be actually useful in healthcare system, we need to have humans in the loop. Um, because, yes, uh, the point of our AI-supported cytology is, of course, not to replace uh, the cytopathologist, but rather to enhance the cytopathologist, the clinician's ability. So this is a tool for the cytopathologist to use. And I will now just again, uh, pardon the plug, show the same uh, slide again of Cytobrowser. Of course, we are using this tool that we developed for presenting the the uh, the results of, 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 of the, the output of the neural network. But um, given that, it might be very difficult to inter interpret this output uh, from the deep learning. Uh, can we understand what is actually the output? And then we get into the topic of XAI, explainable AI, um, which is about making the decision making and the solutions understandable by humans. So instead of having a situation that we see to the left, that if we have an animal classifier, it says, you know, this is a cat, with 99.8% probability, and that's it. 
you don't really know anything uh, and this is probably a, an overconfident estimate instead of having that uh, external AI techniques might say you know yes this is a cat because it has first whiskers and claws because it has features that look like this which have seen and, and, and several other types of cats so um what is the usefulness of XAI? I really think that XAI is, is, is it's it's been constantly growing. I think for the for the last five years or so. Uh, I like to quote Drew Batra on the CVPR uh, presentation where I heard this. So as he presents it, there you can we can look at three usage levels of explainability. And one is that if we if we think that this is the human performance, and then at the lower level we have the machine learning performance. Then we can use the XAI to detect when the, the machine learning, the, the, the deep learning is doing wrong and we can hopefully fix it. Then we have the situation where things are more equal and then a use of explainability is really to gain trust in the deep learning behavior. You know, it, it, it thinks that this is a cat because of the right reasons uh, and then we believe that believe in the statement of it. And of course, the most interesting situation is when the AI system is actually outperforming the humans and doing better. And then we can use this explainability to learn things ourselves, learn things about the properties. And if we see then that, you know, yes, we can do cancer classification much better than what the humans can do. Can we learn things about the disease? Can we learn things about cancer and hopefully then, you know, find better treatments and things like that? So, uh, or to quote Leslie Dahl, uh, I learned a lot from playing against AlphaGo. This is, you know, something that he then can use later on when playing out, uh, Go against other humans. <laughs> so, to repeat the, the, the message, for successful implementation of AI in healthcare, we really must acknowledge the need for cooperation of human experts and AI-based decision-making systems and explainability and interpretability is really crucial to reach that. How far are we then along this road? Uh, well, not so far as I would like to be. The vast majority of explainability systems today, they are of the attention mapping or heat mapping or attribution mapping type, which is typically saying somewhere in this image, uh, this is where I have the interesting information. And this can be useful, but it's not super useful. An example we have to the left, we have let's let's classify cats and dogs. Uh, and and in, the, in the right image, we see that yes, the network is focusing on the face of the dog. And this is decision that it, this is a dog is probably based on something that we can trust. In the network to the left, it is the network is also thinking that this is a dog. But we see that the main reason it believes it's a dog because we have this chicken wire mesh in the background because the dog is probably at the kennel. So it's a reasonable decision to make that this is a dog because you will have less of cats in, in, in kennels. But is this really the information that we want to rely on? And then on the right, we have the similar situation, of course, then for for, for cells, sometimes the network is focusing on the cell nucleus, sometimes it's focusing on the background. What conclusions can we draw from this? Well, you know, now we need an uh, explainability to interpret the explainability. Uh, we looked at this on, on, on a larger scale uh, on, 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 on the image data, trying to you know, look at different patterns of attention for different types of cells clustering this. Uh, so this is a UMAP plot of, you know, is the, the evidence mostly in the background? Is the evidence mostly in the nucleus? Uh, and then uh, again, connecting back with the cytopathologist, is there anything which is different between these cells that you detect? Um, it's uh, not easy to interpret. And I would uh, here quote Cynthia Rudin at, at the Swedish uh, symposium for image analysis 2022 she gave she she presented this image and i quickly took a screenshot of it i think it's it's, it's very speaking uh we want to classify so yes this is the evidence for that this animal is a siberian husky and it's focusing on the face of the husky it looks right but if we're also looking this is the evidence for this animal being a transverse flute it's also focusing on the face and it looks right you know how much of information did we actually gain from this? 
Um, so one thing that we are looking into is, you know, can we do explanations that go beyond uh, saying where the information is, but really towards what is the information that we find interesting at different places of the image? You know, is it texture? Is it shape? Is it symmetry? Uh, and uh, we are just scratching on the surface there. We have tried something which is called concept activation uh, vectors which is presenting uh, patterns like striped or colors, for example, red, and then looking in the internal representations through the network, how does the representation align with this pattern? So you do a scalar product there and checking, you know, is my image aligned with the pattern of stripiness, for example? And that gives us some kind of information. The problem with the, 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 the TCAM model is that these concepts, they, are, they have to be engineered. We have to say that this is stripiness that we're interested in. Uh, and right now we have a, a master thesis who is looking then closer on, on the task of can we actually extract concepts from a trained network. But of course, these extracted concepts should be meaningful for, for us humans. So, so that's, I think there is a lot of work in, in, in this domain to extract concepts and go beyond just heat mapping for, for explainability. Um, the last point on my workflow uh, comes again when we want to implement this in the healthcare environment. We need to trust uh, what is going on. So XAI can give trust, but of course we also need to know that our system is robust. Does it work well uh, on, on outliers? Does it work well under stress? And, and this is a place where deep neural networks really struggle. Uh, deep learning is fantastic when it comes to interpolation. So as long as we are staying within our data domain, then it does good things. When we go out of the, the, the domain that it has been trained on, then it quite often is happy to say whatever nonsense, but being very confident that this nonsense is true. Uh, and the fun thing about rare events is that they do happen, right? So this is another uh, picture I stole. Uh, what will your self-driving car do when faced with an orange sky, which might be the case if there is a big forest fire in the neighborhood, for example. So, um, in, in other words, uh, so let's say we have an animal classifier, a cute kitten. What will that one do if we feed it with a Swedish semla? And it doesn't have, this one hasn't seen anything else in animals. Well, of course it will say this is an animal and probably it will say, yeah, this looks like a cat. And it will be rather over, overconfident. We think that it's 87% chance that this is a cat, uh, which is of course nonsensical. Um, uh, so in order to have something which is useful in healthcare, we need to have AI systems which really are able to assess their own uncertainty uh, reliably and also to express this one, to say openly, frankly, I have not seen anything like this before. I don't know what it is. This is much a better statement than to say that, to, to give the wrong statement, right? In a healthcare set situation, this is really crucial. So we need to have systems that know when they don't know for trustworthy decision making. And this is rarely the case. Network are typically overconfident. You still see in many situations that the softmax output of a network is interpreted as a prediction probability. This is really bad because it, it, it doesn't fit with reality. Uh, the 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 way we are training these networks, they, they, they will be overconfident. So um, the way to fix this problem is called calibration. Uh, so you're essentially adjusting this probability, the output to match uh, what uh, is the real world performance on the separate test sets then. We try different methods um, to make a long story short. What worked best for us, what was called Dirichlet calibration, so one particular method on our trace data. Unfortunately, once we were applying this on the oral cancer data, none of the testing methods actually delivered on the oral cancer data. So uh, room for future work, uh, again, I would say. OK, I'm approaching the end of my talk, so I'm coming to the extras. Um, a couple of minutes on them. Uh, so 
getting back to this interesting question we had uh, on on patient uh, level uh, annotations versus cell level annotations. So we can look at this as a multiple instance learning problem. So a multiple instance learning problem is essentially that you're given a bag of instances and, and then you have a label only for the bag and, and uh, the label for the bag is positive if in the bag there is a key instance. So in this illustration to the left, the key instances will be uh, indicated by red. Uh, and if even if the bag is mostly filled with blue objects, if there is one red object, then uh, in the multiple instance learning kind of definition, this would be a positive bag. So there are a number of techniques to handle this type of data. And this really is the same thing as our uh, cell classification data, right? So we have labels on the bag level, which is in this case, patient levels, and we want to say something about the instances, the cell levels. Why for the cells? Yes, because we want to have human in the loop. We want to be able to show for the cytopathologist, you know, look at this cell, look at that cell, these are suspicious, and give uh, the, the, this as, 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 as output for, for the cytopathologist. And uh, there are te different techniques to do it. One way to do it uh, for the multiple instance learning is to use attention, uh, which is then similar to explainability heat mapping, like what are the instances which were important for you when you concluded that this is a positive bag. Uh, so we tried uh, to replicate this on our data set. Uh, but of course, we don't know the real ground truth, so we had to create a synthetic data set. And then we also created a synthetic data set, uh, which we call PAPQMNIST, uh, which is easy to interpret also for people without a medical background. So we built it on the QMNIST, which is just the extended ver uh, version of MNIST, uh, and added a bit of color variations and rotations. And then we make our own bags uh, of a suitable size. Uh, of course, then we mimic our oral cancer data. We're keeping the size of the images, number of patients, and things like that. So we can we can see how things perform. But we have digits in the bags instead. And then we say that digit four, that's our those are malignant cells. And then we try these different techniques and see how it works. Um, so uh, this is uh, an output result when we are tra trying this. Uh, attention-based multiple instance learning for bags with different percentage of key instances. So the key instances are number four. And what we're showing here are the top 25 detected instances, which are like the most positive ones. Um, so in all of the cases, there are more than 25 digits number four. And this is what, of course, what we would like to show for this for the cytopathologist. You know, these are suspicious cells. Take a look at these ones. And then we want to show the worst cells, right? So we want to show the key instances. We want to show these four. One thing we see that as we go down from 30 to 20 to 10, the performance goes down because what is marked in red are the false positives. So these are other digits that showed up there. Uh, to the right in this slide, then we have the single instance learning situation instead. So that was actually what we used so far. We just ignored the problem at, at, at all. And we just said, you know, yeah, use supervised learning. And we just pick the label of the cell is equal to the label of the bag and see what happens. And what really surprised me definitely when, when we were trying this was that actually the single, the, the, the stupid approach worked better than the special design uh, multiple instance learning approach. So using single instance learning, we have better performance. It works for smaller bags as well. Uh, and also we observed an interesting property of, of this uh, multiple instance learning approach, which we can really see in this data, which is one reason I think the, the PAPQMNIST is very useful because we can really see that, for example, for the case of 30% here, yes, all the fours are aligned, right? So it we have some kind of a mode collapse here. It, it, it focuses on a particular type of key instances, but we know uh, that, you know, fours come in all rotations, right? And that is much better picked up in the single instance learning case. So this is, you know, identifying a, a deficiency of, of, of the admin uh, method here. 
doing the same thing on the oral cancer data. We can't make strong statements, but we can ask our cytopathologist and we really see the similar pattern here. It tends to sometimes focus on a particular, uh, so these are uh, highly keratinized cells, which are orange. This is not really relevant for, for the cancer you know, detection, but, but this method, you know, zooms in on, on, on these ones and says, you know, this is the thing I will look at and, and loses the bigger picture. So we have a mode collapse already, already there. So the take home message here was actually that uh, the single instance learning is performing better, uh, but uh, also uh, a good lesson really is that, you know, it's so nice to work with the synthetic data. We have clear ground truth and we can do this visual interpretation, which is easy for you and me to do, you know, digits. We know how, what they look like. If we would do this with cells, I'm not at all sure that we would notice in, 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 in the same way uh, the mode collapse as, as, as we did here. One thing to say is that both approaches, they struggle when the number of key instances becomes really, really small um, and, and we are continuing exploring in, in, in this direction. Um, before finishing, I will... I think I will skip the, the okay, I will go very quickly through the second the, the, the second extra, uh, and that is just to say, um, can we get more information from uh, our images? Uh, and uh, we are also then running uh, a study on explorative multimodal imaging. Uh, so instead of only using bright field imaging, we're also looking at fluorescence imaging of the same data. And the nice thing, we can do this without restaining. Uh, we just go to another microscope, we get another image. We need to align them, of course, which, uh, which can be a problem, but we have solved that one. Uh, and then we fuse this information uh, from bright field microscopy, fluorescent microscopy of the same cell. Uh, and this seems to really give a boost in performance. This is on a small data set, so it's work in progress, but we see that going from the monomodal situation, we have an F1 score of 0.71. To the multimodal case, we have an F1 score of 0.78. So it is uh, a quite decent boost in performance from this. Uh, of course, we <laughs> want to go back to uh, our cytopathologists and ask them, you know, does this make sense? Um, and in order to do that, we had to hack the, 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 the CIDA browser so that it actually is able to work with then this multimodal data and you can uh, overlay to different modalities and, 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 and look at them together uh, and asking then uh, the cytopathologist. So we go to, you know, these are malignant cells, which are already annotated and kind of ask, you know, the cytopathologist, if you look at the fluorescence data, do you see something? Do you manage to see some pattern? Uh, and I think that the output of this, this experiment was that, yeah, uh, more XAI is needed, uh, which I think is, is a kind of, it closes the loop, right? We now, now we really need to be able to explain. We see that this helps the decision-making. Can we now explain for the cytopathologist, what is it actually in this fluorescence data, which is adding to the performance. Uh, so uh, to summarize a couple of points uh, on my talk, very much there is a need for more public medical data sets. Big data is of course crucial for deep learning. Um, don't trust the, the confidence of the networks. They are typically overconfident. Use some type of calibration, um, but this calibration is data set dependent, so be aware of that. We still need better tools for explainability of deep learning decision making. Really, this is, uh, and we need. Uh, I, I I believe that we need to go towards like beyond heat mapping. We need to have concepts of the what what is important images. Um, combine different modalities to gain more information. Super super nice. Uh, might be the way to give you a ground truth that you couldn't have otherwise. Um, Beyond fully supervised learning, I mentioned self-supervised contrastive learning really paid off for us in the number of cases. So I believe that it generalizes quite well. And yeah, human in the loop uh, requirement for, for real world usage. 
and then be aware that of course then we need to we need to find this sparse and highly specific evidence because a human will not make an average statement of 100,000 cells that's not something our brain can handle but if we can give you know few information you know look here uh, look here then uh, we can get good usage of of the processing power of the human mind and uh, of course everything is open source available on our github uh, and feel free to use it uh, and with that uh, i would like to say thank you for listening thank you for talking uh, i think we can have a few minutes of, of questions and uh, and i will start with a question which is not really yet formalized in my head about sort of connected to the self-supervised learning and and the con used in conjunction with contrastive learning um and it's also in connection with the explainable ai thing uh, and and domain expertise like what features is there and what signals are there in the in these um, in the data that that you're actually looking for um or that the models do react to so how do you define the right proxy tasks for for self-supervised learning and how do you define the right augmentations for uh for 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 the contrastive learning are you looking for texture are you looking for shape are you looking for color you were you were talking about no, so a so bit. I, I i'm i'm a fan of of learning things from the data and trying to avoid human bias um but it is known that uh, the, the the chromatin texture is important. Uh, so that is things, and, and the shape of the nucleus is important for the humans to make their decisions. So we can assume that these things will be important also for the network. But I, I kind of left this uh, approach of, of pre-computing features. I mentioned it that, you know, if we do give an input, a texture measure, then the performance goes up a little bit. I would love that the network learns this by itself instead of that I'm making this educated guess that this is the way you should compute it. So in that sense, um, I, I, I like to not specify this, but if you want to do self-supervised learning, of course you, you need to define the task in one way or another. Uh, and with the contrastive learning, uh, essentially what, what you want to show are data augmentations that correspond to real variations in the image material. So uh, one way to, to, to really approach this would be, of, is, is of course, to take the same sample and image it in, in the number of microscopes. And, and in that sense, you know, okay, I know that this is the same sample. How does it look in different microscopes? Uh, and this variation that I see there, I know this is, this is not a, a real change of the data, and this I can help me to decide what is a realistic data augmentation that I can use in, in my self-supervised learning. Great, thank you. Uh, we had a raised hand. I think it was uh, Zhang. Uh, <coughs> uh, thanks for your talk, and uh, uh, I have one question about your um, your part about expandable, expandable AI and uh, yeah, also working on some similar task uh, about uh, using a class class activation map to try try to find some region of interested parts and explain what the deep neural deep neural network doing on the uh, breast image diagnosis. But I uh, but uh, I also read uh, found some papers in they claim um, this kind of uh, a classic activation map not very reliable and uh, uh, etc. And uh, do you have some idea about uh, um about this? Uh, it's it's a very good question, and I think it's it is a little bit of a a discussion topic in 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 the field. Uh, should we at all use ex explainability, or should we go for interpretability instead? Uh, where uh, interpretable interpretable networks would uh, correspond to uh, models which are intrinsically understandable. So 
a shallow learning approach would be an interpretable method if we can interpret the features that goes into it. So if we measure, you know, the area or the size of my of my cells, and I see that this comes out in in a shallow learning setting as you know important features, then I don't need the explanation beyond that. Then I can immediately interpret what is going on. And actually, Cynthia Rudin is is. Uh, she she was working along that path with explain with with using part based um, decision making. Um, unfortunately, using interpretive method typically means that you 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 might suffer a drop in performance because your your methods are less flexible. So then the question is, I mean, okay, but we so we have trained a, a, a big system which we don't know how it works. And then we make another uh, system which you know should explain what this network works, how it works. But but how 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 can we trust this explanation of the network if we if we want to do this to actually gain trust in what is going on? Uh, and I think that that is a bit of a problem. You know, if I if I explain network A with with method B, which is which is also very complicated, did I actually gain anything in in, in trust in 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 the output performance? Um, and and one thing with this kind of heat mapping uh, techniques, so um, is that the networks are highly nonlinear. Uh, and 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 uh, just one heat mapping will tell me, you know, yeah, this is for for this particular image, uh, I get this response, and then we in our brain thinks that you know, okay, this uh, this will extend beyond this particular image, probably. I I think looking at this dog, that you know, if if the dog is 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 uh, slightly darker, I will still have the same pattern. Or if I move the dog a bit to the side in the image, I will have the same pattern. But we don't have any guarantees about that, right? Because the network is really highly nonlinear. Uh, so I think that all of these explanations have to be used with a little bit of care. But in lack of anything which is better, you know, uh, it's it's also a pragmatic approach. Great. Have any more questions? Otherwise, thank you very much, Joachim. Thank you. Uh, next seminar is uh, uh, let me see. Next seminar is on uh, February twenty second. Uh, it is because uh, next week the seminar is cancelled uh, due to various reasons, and then we're actually on winter break on the week seven. Uh, so the next seminar is week, week eight, the uh, twenty second of February, and it's going to be Alexander Mattis from EPFL talking about uh, measuring behaviors and modeling the brain with machine learning. So don't miss that. And thank you and goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye.